Hi, everybody. This is Dave Lover, uh, Vice President of Strategy and Technology for formerly Aero SI, now Converge One. Um, we've got a great topic today. I, I think, as, as you guys know, we've been doing this series uh, on emerging technologies. And, and some are really outside of people's comfort zones, and some are just barely outside of people's comfort zones. And, and Equinox is kind of, um, it's one of those where I think everybody's starting to, to look at it, to adopt it. Um, and uh, but it's a little, it, it incorporates some some things that people might not be familiar with, especially in network settings and all kinds of different things. So we thought that this would be a good topic. And uh, usually I get to be the one who introduces our presenter. Well, I get to introduce myself uh, and because I'll be the one presenting today. So um, if you do have any questions at all, please feel free to uh, to type them into the questions section. Uh, and uh, I'll I'll get to those either as you know if maybe if I recognize that there's some that I'm that we're coming up on uh, we'll work them in that way um, or if it's a good uh, stopping point to take a look I'll do that as well so feel free to ask any of those kind of questions uh, we've got a whole bunch of people coming in this is awesome and I know this is spring break week for a lot of people um, but a lot of people have already been asking hey with the fact that I'm uh, living the dream, you know, hunting for pine cones or or doing whatever, uh, you know, can I can I listen to this after the fact? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, we record this and we get it done, and and uh, we'll have it posted out on our website and our YouTube channel. So definitely take a look at those uh, if you want to share it with uh, your coworkers or anything else. That is great. So uh, again, today's topic of I Equinox, and um, you know me, I'm the guy who wants to kind of show how it's done, and so um, I was the one that kind of uh, focused on some of the initial deployment internally uh, within ASI and um, and then kind of handed off to our our, our, our our telephony team and our IT team to, for mass rollout. But um, so I've been living this uh, for quite a while and I've been having a good time with it. So um, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the, the tool itself, right? Equinox, what is it? Uh, I, but I want to talk about two, some of the things that are um, are needed for it because Equinox is, is a little bit interesting. Equinox can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. Uh, it just depends on what kind of resources you have. And it's so I, I always think of it as an aggregator of services. Um, and so if you have all the cool stuff in the Aura portfolio, Equinox can take advantage of it. If you don't have all this stuff, it can still be useful for you. Um, and we'll kind of show almost like a building block approach of, of what we do with that. Um, we along, uh, as I do that, I'm gonna talk about some of the text configuration files. And, and you know that is like the settings file. Maybe on a hard phone, it's the 46XX settings.txt. Well, in this world, you can kind of name it whatever you want it to be, um, but it's the exact same format. It's the you know the, the standard kind of settings that we'd see. And that makes it tremendously easier when deploying um, so that your end users don't have to go configure it themselves. If you're making end users configure their own software nowadays, um, that's a horrible, horrible idea. Um, make it easy. And I'll show you some really good ways to, that we can do that. All the way from starting with simply the unified login, um, which you know it makes it so they don't have to log into all of those aggregated services. But we can also use DNS records and specific Specifically, the standard is called DNS uh, SD for service discovery. And it is what really allows um, the client, the, the Equinox client, to go figure itself out um, and go, go download what uh, needs to be done without the end user having to even know where the settings file is. So we'll do that. We'll also talk about uh, security certificates. And you guys may have known I've, I've done security certificate presentations in the past. That's easily an hour, hour and a half by itself. So we're going to go very high level and talk about, OK, let's get it. Let's distribute it. Um, let's cut to the chase and just uh, get this app up and running. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, password management. As you can imagine, um, I have way too much content for an hour. So hopefully we'll see if we can get it in an hour. Um, if you got a bail at uh, top of the hour, you know, we can always come back and uh, listen to the recording. Recording, but hopefully that'll uh, give us some good stuff. Um, so let's start with what is Equinox. Um, Equinox is basically Avaya's new soft phone. Um, if you're familiar with One X Communicator, um, it's kind of the next version of that. I say kind of because One X Communicator still exists, um, but it's really for a very, 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 very different purpose. Um, when I think of, of One X Communicator, I'm thinking of trying to create a desk phone experience in software. 
where when I think of Equinox, I'm thinking of a collaboration tool. So you kind of got to think about what your users are. How do they work? Do they do they really actually care about busy indicators? Well, I, I don't know that Equinox is the great thing for that, right? Um, we 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 think in terms of presence when we start thinking about uh, Equinox, um, and so there's a lot of different things. But it definitely takes a mobile first philosophy. Um, it should be functional inside the office, outside of the office, again, without making your end users think about any of that. Um, and so, again, we'll kind of go through a lot of it, but I, I kind of, I compare it quite a bit to Skype. So if you're a Skype user, you're going to see some, um, some big similarities. Some might say, well, there's already a lot of overlap. So I already have Skype. Do I still want Equinox? And yeah, that's a great question um, because at some level they are doing very similar things. Um, but I think uh, Avaya knows communications um, and they, I find the user interface to be better. Um, but uh, at some point, yeah, you kind of need to decide how you want to do that and, and which which uh, route do you want to go. But we'll talk about all the things that make Equinox cool, and then you can kind of make your own decision as to how you want to deploy that. Um, so we will talk about those components. You know, if um, you know, you know I, I describe this as an aggregator of services. Um, and there's a lot of different things within the Aura portfolio, and the question is, how does Equinox leverage that? And the easiest way is kind of, again, building block approach. At some level, you could have this thing just be a soft phone, right? Nothing else. The only thing to note is it is SIP only, right? There's no H.323 version of this. So um, that means you have to be SIP enabled. You're, that means you have session manager. It means you have system manager. It means you have that appropriately administered uh, to make that happen. I can also do, if you remember the old 1X mobile, I believe is what it was called, right? Where I could have a mobile phone that would actually do EC500 um, calling. Um, yep, I can do that as well within uh, the Equinox client. And um, it's just important to know it only works on the mobile versions of this. Um, maybe I didn't highlight before, Equinox um, works in a lot of different platforms. So it works on iPhones, iPads, um, your, your Android tablets, works in Windows, and it works on a Mac, all natively, right? So um, if those are the big uh, OSs that, that are, are available here. But EC500, is it's a mobile thing, right? You're dialing a FNE, if you remember that term, a feature named extension, um, to gain access to telephony features from Communication Manager. Um, it does that, but it's not gonna do that on the Windows version, obviously, or the Mac version. It's gonna be more for iOS and Android. Um, I can do video, point-to-point uh, -point is built into the app. Um, I don't need any special licensing. Um, that changed uh, when Avaya switched their uh, licensing model. So I can do point-to-point -point video between any of these applications. Uh, and even um, some of the hard phone applications like Vantage, right? I can do that stuff as well. Um, it, as soon as you want to start doing conferencing, like and whether that's video, uh, voice conferencing, or you know, desktop sharing, um, now you need some kind of a conferencing service from Avaya, specifically Avaya Aura conferencing or uh, Equinox conferencing, um, and so you know that it can aggregate that and give you some cool capabilities there as well. Um, we have enterprise directory lookups, right? Specific LDAP. Most people use Active Directory, and, and AD is LDAP compliant, so that. Uh, certainly works in that bucket as well. Uh, and instant messaging, uh, we've got that. And um, the, the big difference, I don't want to just call it instant messaging because Avaya's version of instant messaging is very different than the standard definitions of instant messaging. Number one, it's persistent. Um, it's and, and persistent is a, in a very important word to use when we talk about instant messaging. It means it's there whether you are logged in or not, and it exists at the server level, not the client level. So even um, it, it means I can start a conversation on one device and move to another device, and all of my chats are still there. So if I were to compare it, it's probably more typical to Microsoft Teams than it is uh, Skype. Um, and so it's, it's again, it's persistent chat is the term we would use, and it's fully multimedia. I can you know do, attach video files or, or pictures or whatever I want with that uh, within the instant messaging. Uh, it, it can aggregate presence, um, you know, which is basically a SIP-based call state. You know, think of a busy indicator, but so much more useful. A busy ind indicator simply shows if you're on the phone or not. Um, presence is meant to describe, well, I'm not even in the office. I'm on vacation. I'm busy. I'm, 
uh, all of these other things. And so we can aggregate uh, the presence capabilities of, of the Avaya or a portfolio as well. And we get basic calendar service. Um, and I don't think this is for the purpose of being your calendar, but the fact that I can leverage the calendar, recognize that you have a conference call coming up, identify the dial-in and participant codes and um, connect you automatically, that is really, really cool, right? And from a mobile standpoint, we've all been there. You're in, on the road uh, driving and you have to join a conference call and you're getting a little bit panicked like, okay, can I really remember 12 digits in a row to get into this conference bridge? I can't, I can't even remember six. So I end up having to write it down and, and this makes it so much easier. It has access to your calendar. Um, it sees that you have a conference call and you can push a button and it'll log you in. Uh, device services, which we're not going to, and this is specifically Avaya Aura device services. Um, this is for simplified user deployment. We're not, not going to talk too much about device services. A lot of things I'm going to talk about today don't require device services, but there's some really, really, really cool things um, that device services gives you that you very seriously will want to look at. Um, and um, well, I'll hit some of those, but um, the big thing there is it does require really seven, whereas a lot of the other stuff we're gonna talk about is more of a 6.3 thing um, as a minimum. Although, again, I will always say, you know, seven, seven is, is gonna be certainly recommended. We'll talk about those. Um, client enablement services, that's CES. CES is, I, I would say it's kind of a going away thing. Um, it's a, a, a not a dead concept, but um, I, f I find its usefulness not to be that relevant, um, you know, based on the other things that I can do with this. But um, it, Equinox on the mobile side absolutely does have the ability to take advantage of CES if you have it. Um, we also get some desktop integration, Outlook, um, you know, click to call uh, from the web, click to call. I can add conferencing details to appointments all very easily. Um, so we'll, we could talk about that. And, uh, and to see if, if um, uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, uh, so I question, a relevant question just came and said, is advice services also known as ADDS? Um, no, um, it's known as AADS, meaning Avaya or a device services. Um, so I don't know if there's an extra D in your version of that, um, but it's AADS, Avaya or a device services is what we're talking about there. Um, and so let's get into a little more specifics, right? When I, I want to say, well, okay, oh boy, that's a lot of stuff that the Equinox client can leverage. Do I want to leverage it all? Maybe, maybe not. Um, part of it depends on, well, what do you already have? And maybe what do you want to add to your system? Um, Aura is a very modular platform, right? Um, if you don't need presence, don't add the presence server. If you don't need chat, don't add the multimedia messaging server. Um, those kind of things uh, become relevant for that. So um, if you just want to do basic, you're like, hey, Dave, this all sounds great, but I just need to be a, a mobile soft phone. Awesome. Um, then let's just leverage that piece of it. I would say um, uh, Equinox requires, and it's down here, it's a minimum of Aura 6.2 Feature Pack 4. We all know that that's a platform version. The specific releases inside a feature pack four are actually these. So it me needs a minimum of communication manager 6.3.6. .6. I would, I'm not gonna say you're crazy to do it less than seven, but you will enjoy the benefits of 7.0.1 um, if you have that. Um, same way with session manager, you need at least 6.3.8, um, but I will say 7.0.1. System manager, uh, 6.3.8. Um, you need some kind of a web server to host this stuff. You know, utility server is one version of that. I'll admit, I'm not a fan of utility server. I tend to like um, just regular old uh, uh, servers, uh, web servers, either IIS, Apache, something like that, but um, yeah, it's up to you. Uh, if you're gonna do anything outside the enterprise, then you need an SBC. Um, and so Avias is the SBC for enterprise, uh, minimum of 6.3. I really like 7.0.1 uh, for the SBC. Uh, there's a lot of enhancements that came in the SBC with release seven. Um, and I think most of you guys know that um, even with the, the licensing that's come out, the suite-based licensing, um, those licenses are included as an entitlement uh, with, with even the core license suite. So it, it kind of be crazy not to take advantage of that SBC. It does a great job um, with SIP trunks, uh, does a great job with um, the mobile remote workers, whether it's Equinox or even remote hard phones, all that's great stuff. Um, so again, in the spirit of, okay, well, I, I have to configure these things. Um, so what do we want to do with that? Um, also, I, another question before I get too far is AA, 
DS required to access a corporate directory? That answer is no. Um, I can use device services. I certainly can do that. And um, it changes from using standard LDAP ports to kind of incorporate it directly in the app. But actually the way I'm gonna show it to you is I'm gonna use um, natively where the app uh, Equinox will talk directly to device, um, sorry, to the LDAP server, not requiring device services. But again, I, I, I think there are some benefits to uh, a more aggregated approach to contacts um, that come with device services. So I definitely recommended, but not required. Um, so to configure, and these are all standard kind of things. If you've ever done any SIP related endpoints, you're going to recognize these, right? First, you have to enable the the, the VoIP calling to even turn that on within the app, because it's maybe it's possible you're going to deploy Equinox only using the EC500 stuff, um, and it's just using cellular voice minutes, not data. Um, maybe then you want to turn this VoIP calling to zero to turn it off. Um, but uh, you do have to install the certificates, right? Security trust certs. Um, and uh, we do that just with a very simple command set trust certs. And that will have the phone automatically download those certs. Um, so you don't have to get too creative with mobile iron or uh, even active directory group policy to push certs. Um, you can just have the uh, app ask for it. Um, we can we'll talk about the trust store. Um, we'll talk more about certs later on, but that gives you an idea of this. Do we want to disable the, the password? Do we want to force a logout? Um, this one right here, the iOS 10 call kit. Oh my gosh, do you want this in a big way? Um, uh, this is so. This is a. A lot of people had complained of the early versions of Equinox, where if your phone was locked and you received a phone call, you had to unlock your phone to access the app to answer it. Yep, that had nothing to do with Via. That was that was iOS. That was Apple that said they that was their deal. Um, well, in release in iOS version 10, they introduced a, a new developer capability that people could write apps to allow you to access the phone interface even from a locked position. So it obviously requires iOS version 10, and you want to enable that. I have can imagine why you would not want to enable that. It's a huge feature and big benefit. Um, yeah, we want to do SIP. Yeah, we want to talk about the SIP controller lists. Um, uh, you know, what I'm, you know, this note down here, I, I think it's important to use split horizon DNS, which means uh, you're going to have your internal DNS servers resolving a name to be session manager. And you're going to define, you're going to have external internet DNS servers take that exact same FQDN and resolve it to the public side of the SBC. So now an end user can be inside the building and it works efficiently and you can leave the building and it'll work and be efficient. And it'll actually hand off seamlessly between these going inside and out. Um, so some people will say, well, maybe even inside, I want the mobile Equinox client to not have internal access, but just register to the outside SPC. And that's absolutely a doable option. Uh, the only thing you have to worry about there is licensing, maybe on the SPC, and make sure you've got um, the capacities and, uh, and the bandwidth to do that kind of stuff. But um, it, that's certainly an option. Personally, I tend to do the split horizon stuff where when they're inside the network, they go straight to session manager. And when they're outside the network, they go to uh, the SPC. Uh, I set the domain just like you always would. Um, this MDA join is a critically important uh, feature. Um, you must, if you're older than 6.3.7, you absolutely positively, without a doubt, set that to zero. Um, Communication Manager had a really ugly bug where if you set that to be a one on older versions, um, what this would basically do is if you had multiple SIP phones, uh, like you as a user, like my desk phone and my mobile Equinox client, um, you know the magic of SIP. I can have uh, multiple instances of my extension logged in at the exact same time. And if I was on one device, I could join my same call from a different device. That's the multi-device access join. Um, if you have a communication manager 6.3.7 and you attempt to do that, you will you will crash communication manager. And I am not kidding. Um, I, I really tried hard to make sure you understand the significance of that. Bad, 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 ugly bug. Um, so as long as you're over 6.3.7, um, now you can join and it's a great feature. But for the love of God, do not do that um, on an older version of communication manager. Uh, also, call journaling. Uh, this is a fairly new feature with uh, Equinox. 
where now all of your call history is stored at the PPM level within a session manager. So um, when you log into one device and then have a phone call or not have a phone call and you log into a different device, it's, it's, your, it's your single call history is stored centrally. Um, which is just great because in the old H.323 or anything other than SIP, um, you had to be that it was the phone that was storing your call history, not the server. So it was only the phone that you were logged into and have it. If you switch to another phone, your, your call history is gone. With SIP and call journaling turned on, you get um, that capability to do uh, you know, centralized. Very, 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 very cool. Um, Next, um, we, if you want to do that EC500 concept, um, you know, we're using FNEs. Well, you have to set those FNEs, uh, the feature named extension. And um, those are all just the, you, you enter basically the phone number. It's a lot of communication, not a lot. It's communication manager administration. We just have to tell the Equinox client what that is, uh, what, that, uh, what those numbers are that relate to all of those. Um, so not hard. Um, I, I, this probably isn't bare minimum, but it's so easy to set up, why wouldn't you do it, is the calendaring capability. Um, by default, if you don't do any administration uh, for calendar, um, the client will simply use the calendar that is co-resident on that device. Meaning, if I have a Windows computer and I have Microsoft Outlook, um, Equinox will automatically show and, and talk to the Outlook that is installed on my desktop. Um, and suck it in and you can kind of see where um, I've got some some meetings in here and the ones that it recognizes a phone number it automatically adds a little icon that I can just click it and I'm done um, so that's I think pretty cool um, you should know that busy uh, you know buttons from your phone kind of an old dead concept right and this is why it's important to think if you're looking for that you really want a phone and a soft version of a phone that's really not equinox that is 1x communicator so I I find it weird that we even have some of these um, you know, buttons that are being ported over. So busy indicators, I just think are useless um, in the new world. So, but it's up to you. Some of them are in there, um, not all of them, and that's important, but uh, some of those buttons are certainly in there. Um, you know, when you're actually in a call, once you've got that administered, uh, you have the typical stuff you can do. You know, I can still transfer a call, extend a call, um, and maybe add somebody that'll automatically engage the conferencing capability. If you have conferencing, I can start sharing or I can end the call. All the tra traditional basic dial tone kinds of functionalities are absolutely there. Um, but what's really cool is if, um, I'd say one of the downsides of using the calendar integrated into the device, is, especially in Windows, you have to have Outlook open for this to work. So if you open up Equinox and you don't have Outlook open, well, there's no way to get to it because it's connecting to the client, not the server. Well, as of six, or I'm sorry, uh, Equinox 3.2, fixed in 3.3, um, Avaya now has the ability to let you talk directly to an exchange server. And it even works with Office 365. So now you can have Equinox talk directly to Exchange, the server, and, and skip the Outlook client uh, directly, which in my opinion is the only way to go. Um, it makes it much cleaner. And it enables some other things that I'll mention in a little bit here. But the administration for that is really easy. Do you want to do it? Yes, put it on. Um, where's the server? If, you, if you're doing Office 365, that's outlook.office365.com. And then what's your domain for that uh, Exchange web server uh, capability? Uh, <clears throat> next, if you want to add conferencing, again, uh, we are talking two very specific products. Um, Avaya or Conferencing 8 is one of your options, uh, or Equinox Conferencing 9. Um, and this allows you to conference voice, video, and content sharing. Now, you should know that if you don't have any conferencing, um, this is actually a newer feature in Equinox. Um, the initial versions of Equinox said you had to have uh, one of those conferencing servers to get any kind of conferencing. Well, now what they uh, do in the more recent versions, um, I can, if you don't have any conferencing administered, it'll automatically use communication managers conferencing. Now that's as cool and as sucky as communication manager conferencing is, right? It's, it's a voice and voice only, and it's six parties. That's it, period, end of story, nothing changes. Um, so if you liked it, great, you get it. 
Um, but if you want to go more than six, if you want to add video, if you want to add content sharing, like screen sharing, document sharing, well, now you need to have either uh, Aura Conferencing 8 or Equinox Conferencing 9 to pull that off. So um, I think that's good uh, and works fantastic for those kind of things. Um, to program that, there's just a couple of settings. You know, one is you have to tell it where, how to access that conferencing server. Uh, and so, again, with Aura Conferencing specifically, we, we, we create a, an, what's called an ad hoc conferencing number um, that allows you to, to get in and, and do that stuff. Um, and then if there's an access number, right? If you're going to join your conference, what's the number that it uses to dial that? And because I have a direct integration with the conferencing controls, I also need to go how to get to the collaboration uh, agent, is what Mavaya calls it, um, which is a URL. So just give it uh, that information. From there, it'll automate a whole heck of a lot of the stuff. And it's really, really, really cool uh, of what you can do with it. So, um, so take a look at that. Uh, oh, I jumped ahead. Um, now, a little combination. If you're doing Exchange Web Services, EWS, you also get to take advantage of a new plugin that can, comes with Equinox that I love beyond belief. We've all been there, right? You're, you're setting up a conference and you want the people to join your conference call and you start copying and pasting. Okay, here's the, the URL, here's the participant code, here's the this, here's the that. Um, have I made that incredibly easy? If you have Equinox, and you have Exchange Web Services, so not just standard calendar on the device, but you have to have EWS. Um, now you get this plugin that works beautifully where you open up like you're creating any appointment, you click this button under meeting details, it opens up this window and says, oh, here, let me populate it. It automatically populates the location and automatically populates this stuff. And then I hit save and or send or whatever I'm doing with that. Um, you can also, and I'll admit I don't use this a lot, inside that meeting, it will, it'll pop up a start button where when I push that, the start button will launch the Equinox conference uh, and automatically join you to it and kind of handle the, the, the soft phone side. So that integration is really, really cool. Um, okay, we've got a bunch of questions that have been coming in. So let me take a look at those. Um, uh, good. First question is, if I developing uh, Equinox integration to Teams? Uh, great question. I don't, I don't know that answer. Um, and you even reference like they're doing with uh, Avaya Communicator for Link. Um, I, it's a great question. I don't know if they're doing it since we all know that Microsoft intends to kind of kill off Link and Skype and just make Teams the client. Um, I would imagine it would be inevitable, but I don't know of any specific roadmap. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Is there a difference between the default calendar from uh, and what you can access via Exchange? So is there a difference between the calendar where you're not doing EWS and the calendar that you are doing EWS? Um, functionally, I'd, I, in terms of what shows up in Equinox, no, same, same exact stuff. Um, but I like the EWS because um, one, I don't always want to have access, um, you know, have my calendar open on my desktop or on my iPhone. Um, iPhone, I suppose, doesn't matter so much. But I, I'd say this reason, this item right here that I still have on the screen of the plugin for Outlook to access cal uh, the conferencing information and shove it into Outlook automatically, you must have EWS to do that. So I'd say that's probably the biggest reason. Uh, listing requirements for Equinox, uh, I didn't seem to mention whether a power license is required. Great question. The short answer is no. Um, the core license works beautifully with all of the stuff I've talked about so far. There are some little things um, like with um, multimedia, the multimedia server for ch a chat to get the true multimedia where I can add files and audio and video clips. That requires the power license. But um, most of the stuff we're talking about, like the SBC is core, almost all of this stuff is just the core license. Um, and I, what I find is most people, um, they, they'll, they might a la carte up individual things that are important if they're not going to go all out uh, power license. So a couple of different things uh, that you can do with that. Um, I'll take one more and then move on. If you have, if you have EWS program, what about the users that use OWA? Um, Will they have a calendar integration? Yeah, because Outlook Web Access is using EWS basically behind the scenes. If you have OWA, Outlook Web Access um, enabled, it's behind the scenes using EWS. 
So you're actually further along. It's just a matter of getting the uh, addresses and the domains right, and all that stuff is great. Okay, next. Um, uh, if you're going to do uh, for conferencing, um, you know, if you want the true integration, you do have to provide Equinox um, information about your moderator code and your, as an individual user, your moderator code and your participant code. Um, if you have AADS, meaning by Aura Device Services, I can actually um, configure that so it'll push even that information down to the client automatically. Um, but if you're not doing it, then you have to tell your end users, hey, if you want Aura, conf true full Aura conference integration, um, you need to go into the settings of the client and fill in the moderator, your moderator code and your participant code. There's no way to have a single code go to everybody. But again, Avaya or a device services can get down to that granular level of, of individual user settings and even automate that piece of it. So I think that's um, a good option as well. Next, uh, instant messaging and presence. Uh, as I mentioned, if once you turn it on, a new window will pop up here, and, and I probably didn't even notice, but on my, uh, my earlier screen, I, the screenshot I had it turned off, um, you won't even see the messages section show up. So um, as soon as you enable Avaya multimedia messaging, which is Avaya's instant messaging platform, that'll show up and give you, um, give you that capability. And administration of it is, um, is pretty easy as well. Um, I think that's about it for that. Um, if you want presence, so presence is separate. Um, and I have heard that Avaya intends to bring presence and instant messaging back together again. Um, but right now it's two different servers. You have multimedia messaging, which is the instant messaging slash chat. And then you have the presence services uh, that is a separate platform. And in 6.3, it was a standalone server kind of a deal, um, Avaya present services. In really seven, Avaya turned it into a breeze snap-in. Um, and so you just, you fire up a Breeze server, you load that snap in and you're good to go. Um, a lot of people say, oh God, does it mean I have to have Breeze? Well, yeah, but I mean, it's really, people think adding Breeze is like this, this rocket science thing. It's really easy. It's all you're really doing is adding a server. You're putting the Breeze platform on that server and then you're, you're just putting the app, the snap in on it. Um, it doesn't mean you need 50 trillion other things. Um, and so it's a very minimal install. And yeah, then you have, yes, you now have Breeze. Um, it's easy. It's not nearly as hard as a lot of people think it is. Um, to do that administration, um, pretty easy again. Um, I, obviously, all of these things I'm showing in the text file, you can certainly do by clicking the little gear up here and going and programming all this stuff manually. That is a horrible way to deploy the app if you're going to make end users do this. So this is why I want you to do it in the settings file, and then I'll show you how you can push that settings file to the phones automatically. Um, and so, uh, you know, where's the server? What port are you using? Do you want to use TLS? Of course you do. You'd be crazy not to. Um, and how often do you want to refresh um, the, the, the information that's coming? Um, other than that, it's uh, really easy. And presence is even easier because you don't have to. Um, the client learns of the presence capabilities through session managers, PPM downloads. So there's nothing you need to do uh, from that standpoint on the client side. Yes, you need to configure the presence profile within the SIP user, um, but again, that's um, a checkbox and, and probably just a checkbox if you've got the defaults uh, set, up, set right. Um, enterprise directory, as somebody mentioned, do I need a via or a device services to get um, access to an LDAP directory? Short answer is no, right? I could set this stuff here where I'm setting, do I want the directory enabled? Yes. Where's the server? What port are we going to use? Are, are we doing secure um, or are we, are we doing TLS based? Um, all of that stuff is there. You set the top uh, DN, um, you do all that kind of stuff understand that you still, your user is going to have to log into this um, and use their credentials. And I'll show you, you know, when we get to this section on user um, or unified logins, um, that becomes a really important piece of a lot of this stuff. Now, um, if you want the desktop integration, and this mostly goes to the, the Windows version of Equinox, um, I could say set enable Outlook add-on to one, that automatically will, will install that conferencing plugin stuff. Um, into uh, into Outlook, 
Um, it'll also allow you to do the, um, you know, to click to call out of out of Outlook. So I can, you know, in, in a contact or in an email, I can call contact and it'll bring up the window, click it, and it'll, it'll launch it and call via your Equinox client. Um, I can also do the enable the browser extension. And so it'll load plugins into your browser that allow click to call from a web page, right? So um, those are things there. Um, three simple little text settings. You can certainly do it in the settings file, um, or the, sorry, the settings configuration in Equinox itself, but it's so much better just to do it via the text file. Um, I've got a whole bunch of, of miscellaneous stuff that I, doesn't really have a home, but they're really cool features. Um, there's some like on a cell phone that maybe you don't want, even if an, a user tries to dial 911 from Equinox, you'd really rather have it go out the cell phone's phone app, right? So it's, it's a cellular call, not an Equinox call. I can do that now in 3.3. I can just say um, cellular direct. I want to enable it. And then you list all of the numbers, you know, separated by commas. I just show, show an example of 911. Maybe when somebody dials 911 from Equinox um, on the cell phone, this is a mobile thing only, cellular, um, it will actually say, no, I don't want you to use Equinox. I want you to go out the cell phone. Uh, capability. So that's cool. The journaling we already talked about, centralized call history. Um, this one is also really cool for the mobile endpoints. I can tell the client to, um, and this is not, I think I said just the cell phones. This is on any of them, um, whether Windows, Mac, you name it. I can tell the client to periodically go back to my server where I keep the settings and find out if there's a new settings file. So anybody who's even tried to do settings files in the past, you know that I uh, got to reboot the phone to get the new settings file. Nope, nope. Now with Equinox, this is basically saying once a day, I want you to go out and see if there's a new settings file. Um, and so if I, the administrator, has made a change to the settings file, every single person is going to get it the next day. Um, and so that works out really, really well and very handy. If I ever wanted to change where my settings file is located, I could do that as well. Um, so I can say the settings file URL, this is something I could change. Like maybe today it's on the utility.arosi.com um, with maybe a certain name and I want to change it. I want to put it on a different server. Well, go ahead and change that um, file. And then when the, uh, the endpoint gets the new settings file, it'll see that, oh, I, I've been moved to a new settings server and go get it there. So cool. If anybody's done mass quantity of this, it inevitably comes up that I have to move my settings file from one server to another server uh, for a billion reasons. But that gives you the, an easy way to do that without having to send an email to every user and say, OK, guys, go change your server address. We're changing it. Um, very, very handy. I can also lock um, preferences. Um, so end users, like I don't have CES. So I don't even want my end users to see that there's a CES configuration. So I, I, I take it out of their menu. Um, and I can really lock that down big if I wanted to. And then um, call, uh, that call kit I already talked about, but that's a, a huge, huge benefit. So um, I've got a bunch more in here. Let's, uh, let's go answer some of these questions. Uh, can Cisco endpoints leverage Avaya present services? Ah, that's a really good question. I don't know if I know that answer. Um, Avaya uses standard, um, uh, the, the standard protocols for that, but I, I don't, I couldn't tell you if the Cisco endpoint uses that as well. I can, within the Avaya present server, federate to other present servers. Um, so if you know we you had to join the, uh, a Cisco present server and federate to an Avaya present server, that you absolutely can do. Um, but I don't know if the endpoint can access it directly. I just don't know. Um, is the, in the multimedia messaging, uh, it's persistent where are the attached files stored uh, and what are the limitations age size? Um, it's stored on the multimedia messaging server and you as the administrator can choose the aging of that and the size and all that kind of stuff. So it's all done uh, just from a web GUI uh, on the uh, multimedia messaging server. Um, can settings file be pushed to a mobile device without AADS? Um, uh, pushed, no. Pulled, yes, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain how we do that. Um, you don't need a ADS to pull that off. Um, and so we'll, I'll, I'll show you that. Uh, server requirements over a full, you can ice how many? Um, yeah, so we kind of already did that. Uh, so I'm uh, sorry, you're not seeing this. Um, are you going to show us the server requirements overall for the full Equinox experience and how many does it really take? I kind of went through those. Um, 
earlier where and I didn't necessarily list hardware uh, server because most of us do them all virtually. And I don't think anybody builds standalone servers anymore. Um, so most of the stuff I talked about could probably fit on one physical server, but you're, uh, that assumes virtual. So there's probably a number of those virtual servers that you need to do. Uh, is, is, there, is there a difference? Be uh, I, don't know, I did that one already. Um, uh, so the question is, uh, per the document on AADS, it states that corporate directory is enabled through LDAP with AADS. That's absolutely correct. Um, you, but you don't need it, right? Just like I showed, I can, I can go directly to the LDAP server. But if you have AADS, what AADS does is basically serve as a proxy or a relay. So Equinox will ask AADS, and AADS is the one who went and asked LDAP. So it's, um, and there are benefits to that, for sure, absolutely. Um, in fact, I kind of like it better that way personally, but I, you don't have to have AADS to get LDAP access. Um, so well, I'll, I think I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, the next is auto configuration. So this whole idea of, okay, we've, we've built this settings file. What are we gonna, how do we get it to the Equinox client? Well, this is kind of the beauty of all of this. And where I said, you don't really push the file, the, the client pulls it down. So when you install Equinox for the very first time on any of the platforms I described, iOS, Mac, uh, um, Android, you name it, the very first thing it's gonna ask you for is your email address. Now what's really kind of cool and funny about this is we don't care what your email address is. But if I ask the end user what I really wanna know, which is what is your domain name, they won't have a clue how to answer it. So we trick them. We say, what's your email address? And they say, well, I'm dlover at aerosi.com. Great, I don't care about the dlover at. All I care about is the aerosi.com. And I immediately start doing stuff. Um, and usually based on, on DNS records. If you can't, um, like if you don't have the DNS records set up or if you're not using device services, another option, which I'm not a fan of, is you could push it via um, the, a web URL. Um, and so what you, I could do is go up to the little gear and it would say, oh, I don't, um, I don't have it, the email address configuration, uh, but I do know the web address of where the settings file is located. And this is, I'll be honest, is a, is a good way to initially do it to make sure you're doing it right um, as an administrator testing your stuff before you deploy it. But for the love of God, please don't deploy this to end users where they have to actually know a web server address. Um, it's just not fair. Um, they're not going to know it, and they'll never remember it later, and they'll they'll never use it. Um, and really, don't use this manually configure. That is the worst thing you could ever do. Um, we want to ultimately get to the web ad or the email address approach to this. But um, so this is where again you could go in and put in a web address. You'd have to know where it is, like http colon slash slash ps dot com slash eq txt, and that that file would be on your web server and be your settings file. And that would tell the client to go get that file name and install it and configure it. Um, but you have to know it. You, you, the user would have to enter that in themselves. So what I prefer to do is when you do the DNS records correctly, and yes, this does require you to talk to your network person or whoever owns the DNS servers to do some work there. Um, but the goal in that experience is we say, yep, go ahead and enter your email address. Uh, and um, what, and I'll show you how, how this actually works behind the scenes, but ultimately I'll get to a point where the client is, it sees multiple service profiles, and then I have two of them in my environment. One is production, one is test. The typical end user would select production. Maybe my beta testers or me, I, when I'm messing around with something, I, I, I use the test profile. Um, but you could do anything you want. You could do East Coast, West Coast. You could do cool people, morons. I, I, you know, I don't, I, however you want to do it, I can create multiple and I only show two. You can absolutely do more th than that. Um, and I'll show you how we do that, but that's kind of the concept. And then all of a sudden it says, oh great, now that I know the profile, I know the settings file, I'll go get the settings file and I will configure the client fully. From there, I still have to log in. Right, all I've done is configured the client. So the next thing it's gonna say is, what are your Equinox credentials? And this is where we get into the unified login that I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, for me, the user, the Equinox credentials is their fully qualified name, dlover at aerosi.com. Um, and I would put in my network pa uh, password. 
Um, and uh, for me, that would get into all of the, the miscellaneous stuff. Then it will ask you for, great, now that I know who you are, and that's really logging into all of those other things like uh, LDAP, like via multimedia messaging, like there's a whole bunch of other things that I'm drawing a blank on, I'll show you in a little bit. Um, but then, then the next thing is, great, you have to log you in as a, as a phone user. What's your extension and what is your communication profile password, right? your SIP password? So they enter that. And then it says, great, let me uh, give you a little tour. Because I, with those three steps, what's your email address? Four, I guess. Email address, pick a profile, what's your Equinox credentials and your phone credentials, you're done. You have every single thing that you need to know. Uh, and it's going to give you a quick little tour guide of, of what's happening um, and you're logged in. So um, we've got a couple of things to talk about to make that work, though. Again, that Equinox login is what Avaya calls a unified login. Um, because there are so many different things that I might have to log in for, if you, if you have um, unified login, which is this SSO enabled zero, if you have that turned off, that means that every one of those aggregated services, your user is going to have to go in and say, what's my username for Equinox meetings? What's my password? What's my enterprise directory username and password? What's my multimedia messaging username and password? And they'd have to enter all of those in. Um, if you do SSO enabled one, that means, okay, when the user enters in their quote unquote Equinox login, what can I all use that for? What can I log in with that one username and password and try to log into all of this different stuff? So, um, and I don't want to make, make it sound that, like that's easy because what I ran into when I tried to do this is my Active Directory expected to see my username in a very specific format. When I did my multimedia messaging server, it was a different format, like it was dlover as opposed to dlover at aerosci.com. Well, the unified login is not going to work. You enter at one time and apply that username and password to all of the different items. So right there, if you can't make that happen, I was able to. I was able to go in and change some of the filters and change how the, the, the format was expected. And I could use one login to log into all of those different things. It worked great for me. If it doesn't work for you, you're going to have to either you can pick your end users, log in each individually, which will be a nightmare, or you desperately need a via or a device services because now I can push individual versions of, of names down to individual users and it'll just log in all willy nilly how it needs to, whatever the, the versions were. But those are the kind of things that you end up having to get to, to be honest. Um, and now it's, it's one login and it's one uh, extension uh, because I'm using this unified login. But that becomes a big deal. Now, what if I want to um, um, bypass some of that other stuff in terms of the, um, you know, as I mentioned, if I want to log in via the email address, how does, it, how does that actually work? Well, it's a concept known as DNS SD, Service Discovery. It's defined by RFC 6763. I could never recite that in a million years if I needed to. Um, but it allows the discovery of services. Um, and we leverage existing DNS records. These already exist. They've existed from the beginning of time, right? I've got PTR records, um, I've got uh, SRV records, and I've got TXT records. Those are the three key records that this protocol uses um, and does double duty on um, to gain access to figure out how to auto configure things. Most internet related um, clients that do auto discovery use this exact concept. So Avaya does that same thing with um, uh, within uh, this environment. So the thing to know is that the Avaya Equinox client is hard coded to ask for a very specific type of service. It is underscore Avaya dash EP dash config dot dash uh, or underscore rather uh, TCP dot whatever your DNS domain is, right? That's where I wanted the arrowsi.com because that's when I need to pre-populate. So that's once I do that, the, the, um, the, the client will actually go do a PTR record lookup. And there's tons of tools out there. I like the G, G Suite uh, dig uh, application. Um, it's open source, go to a website and say, I'm looking for that, right? Everything that I said, this is the part that is hard coded. You can't change it. And then whatever the end user puts as the end of their email address is what we look for. And if I look at the PTR record, I get two very interesting responses back. I get um, two different uh, service profiles. 
One is called the production dot blah, 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 blah. And one is called test dot blah, 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 blah. And if you remember, those are my two profiles that I had show up before. So immediate, that's the uh, Equinox client sees those two records in the response from the DNS server and puts those on the screen for the end user and says, oh, would you like production or would you like test? From there, the end, um, the end user is going to pick one, right, and and say either production or test in, in my configuration. And when they, like in my scenario, let's say they click the production button. Now I'm going to look up a different DNS record. I'm going to look up an SRV record, but for that full amount, production dot underscore via blah, 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 blah. The response that I get back here is, where is the server? Where is the web server that I will find this magical file that, I'm, that I need to get? And it says, oh, it's over at utila1.arosi.com. Okay, so that's, that immediately, the server service record uh, tells me where the file is. Well, then I, it says, great, do a TXT record lookup. And now it says, oh, by the way, that particular file um, that is located on that server is called aeroac.txt. Okay, so now I can know where it is and I know what file it is and the end user is oblivious to all of this. They just downloaded it and they got that file the way they needed to. And you can see if they happen to have clicked the test button instead of the production button, we the server is exactly the same. I didn't show you the SRV record, it's the same but the TXT record actually changes. Now it's arrow AC underscore test dot TXT. So that gives me the ability to apply different versions of this to different, um, depending on what you select. And again, the end user doesn't have to be aware of any of the settings. Um, all they have to know is how to uh, actually log in. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Um, uh, let's see. Can, okay, here's one. Um, can either the login through the DNS server or AADS also deploy the certificate required to the VoIP server? Um, so AADS is not necessarily deploying the certificate. What you do is you put the trust cert on the web server where all these same settings files and your firmware is usually what most people do. So you put the certificate on that exact same server and then inside the um, text file, you say uh, set trust cert, and then you list all the certs. It expects to find those on that same web server. So yeah, I, deploying is probably the wrong word. Making it available for the client to download is, is the more accurate way I would describe that. Um, so that gives us some, some, some really good options. Um, next, we got to talk about certs. And uh, admittedly, we've got about six minutes left. I might be able to pull this off. Um, we all know that there's different ways to get certs. And as I mentioned before, there's I do a whole hour session just on understanding security certificates. But the point of a lot of this is the fact that there's a couple of different types of certs. There's identity certs that literally provide an identity to a, a thing. You know, I'd say a server, but um, that implies some kind of a physical thing. Um, like Communication Manager, for example, has three I, um, I, I certs associated with it uh, for different tasks. So it's the same physical server, but it's, it's different services uh, that need to be encrypted, like the web user interface or the actual SIP communication or some of the logging capability, right? There's different things that it might use. Um, and just so we, um, then the question is, whoever I created the identity cert, I mean, how, how do I know that I should trust that cert? Like, okay, yeah, you gave me a cert, you gave me a driver's license, but you you made it in crayon. How Do I do I believe that? I I, I feel weird believing it. I feel weird trusting it, a, a driver's license written in crayon. But um, what I can do is be told how to trust it and that I should trust it. And that's called a trust cert or sometimes referred to as a root cert. And you're really getting the cert of the person who signed the identity cert that you know, oftentimes it's uh, what we call a certificate authority. Um, and so it's the trust cert that needs to be given to all of these clients so that when they run into uh, an Avaya thing, like a session manager, for example, or maybe an SBC, that it looks at that and says, um, oh, I, um, I, I, I trust you 
because I was told to trust you. So that's what we're actually deploying. We're not deploying identity certs to the clients, although you could. Avaya does support mutual authentication, um, certificate authentication. It gets, that's a whole different story in and of itself. But I'd say generically, you want every client to be told to trust a cert, a cert that was signed by, usually it's system manager. That's one of the options. Um, and so, Actually, this is the slide that probably defines that a little bit better. But um, so you've got the trust cert and you've got identity certs. We need to distribute the trust cert. Um, and very easy ways to get that, right? Um, if you have a system manager, system manager is probably the internal certificate authority that you use for your Avaya stuff. And I, there's, again, a whole bunch of reasons why I might recommend that. Um, but I won't go into them here. But uh, what I can do is then go look at the certificate authority and say, well, show me um, your, your where, um, when you sign a cert, how should I trust you? And we go in and we look at the CA structure and we, we are basically looking for this PEM file. If I download that file, that is the file that I need to distribute to anyone um, who I expect to trust my certs meaning for the purpose of this conversation, the Equinox uh, client. So once I, I've downloaded that uh, from session, uh, from system manager, I need to make sure that the clients um, get it. So what I would typically do is go take that, that cert, put it on my, my web server that has all these settings files, and then I would go in um, to the, the, the setting, uh, the, whatever name the settings file is, and I would say set trust certs and put the name of the file right here. Um, and there's probably other ones in there, make sure it's in there, um, make sure it's not commented out, put it in there and all is good. Um, you do have, and, and this is a fairly new feature, um, Avaya, and part of this was an iOS thing, but there are actually two different versions of uh, places to store security certificates on an iPhone, we'll just say. There's the device itself, which probably already has a whole bunch of different uh, trust certs from different providers like GoDaddy or VeriSign or Symantec, right? They, they come preloaded. But then there's private trust stores that are tied specifically to an application. And this is part of the way that, um, that Apple um, keeps things separate and secure within the platform known as iOS. Um, you have to decide, do you want Equinox to be able to have access to both the device's trust store and the private trust store? And I say the, both of them, the, the device trust store or the private application trust store. If you want it only to access the private trust store, you need to set, set trust store to be zero. If you want it to look at both, then you want it to be a one. I, unless you're ridiculously security conscious, um, I would set that to be one and say, I want to use the devices trust store because it has all the standard ones already um, and the private trust store, which would be you know, where this one, this is going to get downloaded to the private trust store when I use set trust certs, blah, blah, blah. So I'm a big fan of putting it as a one, but um, there's probably could be a conversation to have about whether or not a, a zero is an option there. But just know that, boy, zero is a pain in the butt because now you have to, inside this um, statement, you have to put every trust cert that could possibly be, that this client could be touching, like Semantic, like GoDaddy. Um, you need them all. And that, uh, trust me, it's a pain. Um, so I would say trust the device and trust the, the private store. Lastly, and I, I'm at the top of the hour, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna cover this a little bit. Very quickly, you are gonna find out that if you have horrible passwords for your users, you're, it's gonna become really obvious because you're gonna get hacked pretty quick. Um, the uh, very typical time frame of when an SBC gets plugged into the public internet, um, the, the, the worst I've ever heard was 20 minutes. That it, it took a hacker 20 minutes to find your SBC and to start reg attempting to register to it with fake users. Um, I've never seen it take longer than that. Um, it's, it's, it's eerie. It's how did they know I was there? How did this happen so quick? How did, um, because SIP is a standard protocol and, and hackers will find it. Now, the good news is SBCs are firewalls. So they're good at dealing with that. They've got things like, um, in, uh, 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 denial of service. We can rate limit. There's all kinds of different things we can do that are standard for firewalls 
um, and making sure. But the reality, I have to let the good guys in, right? So you have to be able to differentiate. And the only way to identify a good guy from a bad guy, realistically, because your end users could be everywhere on the planet, is that they authenticate themselves. And if you have an end user authenticating with an extension of 4563507 and a password of 1234, you are in big, big, big trouble because they all try that. Um, that is one of the first passwords that they're gonna try or you think you're being creative with um, uh, the password of 4563507 or your real genius, your password of 4563507 right? Those are all common passwords that hackers know very quickly to get into. Um, and so my computer, my computer that I'm presenting on right now um, has can do 70 registration attempts per second using a hacker tool called Zip Vicious. Um, Google it. It's free to download. It's a Python script. It's really easy. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, but 70 registration attempts per second, meaning a 10,000 combination from 0000 to 9999 can be hacked in 10,000 divided by 70 is 142. Okay, um, and that assumes that I started at zero and I finished at 9999. Um, so if you have a, a password of 0001, I'm gonna get that in a, in a fraction of a second. Even if you go all the way to six digits, it's still less than four hours, I can hack that. Less than, uh, or if with an eight digit pin, okay, you got me, you got two 2.3 weeks. But unless you're paying attention and seeing those coming in, you run the risk of, of getting hacked in two to less than two and a half weeks. Um, and unless you're telling your end users to change extremely regularly, that's gonna be a big problem. So one of the things that we did, um, and this was um, me running into this years ago, um, realizing how bad our passwords were, I said, okay, we have to, we have, to have complex, unique password per user. And as you can imagine, my IT department freaked out and said, there's no way I can staff for that. Um, so we had to come up with a solution and we ended up creating an application that we called Password Pro. It was internal, I, it was all hard coded, right? It wasn't even um, productized, but it allowed um, us to change the password uh, with a defined frequency, meaning we'd age the password. We could define a certain complexity. I could even store a hashed version of previous passwords and say, yeah, sorry, Mike, you already used that password, pick, pick another one. Um, and so we can we can do that, but it absolutely helps uh, you know, increase security, reduce the help desk cost because you don't need to staff somebody to do it, and implement a solution quickly. Because um, basically we're doing that as um, was that it? Yeah, so that um, we're doing it as a service within Microsoft Azure actually. So um, this is what the end user ends up seeing in Password Pro. Um, they log in and they only get this profile tab. They don't get the admin tab, but they go in and, and say, oh yeah, your security code has expired. You ignored our emails. Um, or if they forgot their password and they need to change their password, they can click this and then change their password. Um, but um, Password Pro works with non-SIP endpoints. It works uh, with uh, EC500 if you're doing the security pin. Um, certain feature access codes require a station security pin. We modify that as well. Obviously with uh, System Manager, we're mostly dealing with the communication uh, the profile, which um, the, pass the password assigned to the profile. So it's SIP endpoints, it's Aura conferencing user logins. Um, we even have the ability to, if you're doing it through System Manager, um, I can uh, age or define a complexity for uh, modular messaging, five dot whatever, or uh, any of the Aura messagings. So very high level on Password Pro, very high level on security certificates. I have hour long presentations on all of those, um, but hopefully this gives you a good understanding of um, you know, what it takes to really deploy Equinox and uh, what we can do uh, with a lot of that stuff. Um, so that's the session. I'm gonna I'm run through some of these questions as a bunch have come in recently. Um, so hopefully you guys can stay. If not, I totally understand. We are recording this conversation. This uh, so we'll we'll have it posted out on our uh, Aero Systems Integration YouTube channel, uh, as well as on our website. Uh, eventually, I think we'll have it show up in uh, in the, our Converge One stuff as we merge a lot of that. Uh, that marketing content, but that uh, gives you a good idea. So um, I gotta remember, where did we leave off? Uh, can, he, um, can you, uh, good question, okay, this is a good one. Um, can you configure Equinox without 
prompting for an extension, just an email. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about AADS, right? You know, I, I gave a little high level version of it, but one of the cool things that AADS does is when you have configured it, and that's actually one of the things that you would use is what is your, you know, your Equinox login could actually reference going to, uh, um, to the device services server. You'd authenticate there, and what AADS will do is create a one-time use configuration profile um, or settings file that um, has all of those individual um, settings like what is your extension, what is your password, what is um, what is your login into enterprise uh, directory? Not that you do that if you had uh, AADS, but you know, so I can start populating individual customized settings file per person that will then get sent securely to the client. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, does that mean Password Pro is irrelevant? I'm like, holy crap, no, no, that's, you still need Password Pro in a big way because even though, um, you're not technically logging in. You're not doing a SIP registration with your uh, email and your AADS password. Um, all you're doing there is getting a, uh, a one-time use configuration file that contains your extension and SIP communication profile password. So your communication profile password is still exposed. So if it sucked before, it still sucks. Um, and so it's, it's, it just means that the end user for the purpose of logging into Equinox doesn't have to know their extension or PIN because the AADS is passing that information to the client uh, uh, in, in a settings file. And so it's a one-time use. It, um, it's so the client now knows that information, logs in, and AADS deletes that one-time use file. So um, it's kind of an interesting scenario, but it is a little bit misleading. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm logging in with my email. No, you are not logging in with your email. You are just getting a very customized file that contains your extension and password. Um, and again, like I said before, if you had a crappy password before, you still have a crappy hackable password. So you need to deal with that. Uh, can I encrypt the config file? Well, I can certainly put um, AAD, or I could put my settings file um, in uh, in a secure website, HTTPS. Um, so the transmission of that absolutely would be, that's the purpose of TLS on a website, right? I can do that. But I think for the purpose of, that you're you're asking, can I see it? Um, yeah, um, personally, I, it, those are things that don't concern me as much. Like I said, the um, horrible passwords is your much, much bigger issue uh, related to uh, security, I think, on most devices. Are certs pushed down to the endpoint over PPM? Nope. Uh, they are still downloaded from your web server. Um, can, uh, can we put a cert on the phone and have the SBC cert? Uh, or have the SBC check for the cert to help prevent uh, fraud. Yep, that's called uh, mutual authentication. So not only am I authenticating or trusting the identity cert of the SBC, I can also have the SBC ask to see, do I trust the identity cert of the phone? So short answer is absolutely yes. The long answer is that is one heck of a lot of administration that needs to be done because you're now you're talking about um, uh, like what EAPS and and you're now you, the question is how do you get those temporary identity certs installed on the client? It's very doable. It's absolutely supported in Equinox 3.3, um, but careful what you ask for. That's that's a pretty big undertaking that I still don't know a lot of the people who are doing that. Uh, can you identify? Uh, can you define what users can log into an SBC to help malicious uh, login attempts? Um, if we have SIP clients that should be internal only, can they be set to internal only or leverage a less complex and leverage a less complex password? That's a great question. Um, short answer is I think you can do some firewall rules that would do that. I would hardly call that scalable, um, but I think you could, there's probably, I don't know if you do it in a Sigma script or something that says, hey, um, I, I, I will tell you, I don't know of anybody doing that, um, where you're, you got to remember, the purpose of an SBC is to serve as a proxy, not a registrar. You don't register to an SBC. You register through an SBC and ultimately get to a session manager. Um, so the more work that you put on the SBC to do that level of checking, 
um, I think you might be pushing the boundaries of, of uh, again, I, it's just not a common thing you'd expect a, an SBC to do. Can you do it? Yeah, I think you can, but I'd be a little nervous about uh, some of that stuff. Uh, what about APIs? Um, that is actually a pretty cool story. Um, Avaya uh, has this thing called the Client SDK. It is a series of, uh, it's a software development kit that leverages the APIs exposed from Session Manager, Communication Manager, et cetera, um, and you could build your own client. Um, if you didn't like uh, Equinox, you can go build your own iPhone client or your own Windows client or your own Mac client. Um, and in fact, what's really awesome about this is Avaya's developers used that exact same client SDK to build Equinox. So a lot of a lot of manufacturers out there, they'll give you an SDK, but you don't ever think you're going to create as cool of a client as they build. Well, Avaya takes a different approach. They're like, we are going to create the coolest software development kit that we can that we want to use. And oh, by the way, you can have it too. So you can use the client SDK to build your own equally cool app. So I think that's a pretty powerful statement um, about the openness of Avaya's platform. Um, yeah, so this webinar was re forwarded to me by an associate. That's awesome. Thank you for joining and thank you to, for your associate. Can I get on your DISTI list for webinar series and others? Um, so let me give you a little story about this. We started this um, webinar series in January with the intent every, every Thursday at 11 a.m. Um, we pick a different topic and we have this from, and I had to schedule up through the end of the year. Well, then we got acquired, right, by Converge One. And um, I said, wait, okay, um, as a minimum, I'm going to change the platform from GoToMeeting to something else, which means I've got to reset some stuff. We also have some org changes happening, and I, there's things that I've got to figure out. So I've, I, we've actually um, canceled this webinar as of uh, the end of this month. So we're going to go through the end of April, and um, it's done. My full intention once things settle down a little bit, is to relaunch this webinar series, and then we'll get a new, you'll get a new invite, I'm sorry, uh, but it'll probably be on a new platform with probably a bigger audience to, to draw from in terms of content and expertise. But um, that's kind of the story as it relates to this. So for those of you that you're gonna, you'll get a cancellation, I'll send out something saying, hey, you know, the last Thursday in April is the last one of this. And then we'll relaunch at some point. I don't know if it'll be right in May. It just kind of depends on how things shake out. But if you guys would like to send me an inf uh, an email, uh, dlover, you saw my email everywhere, dlover at arrowsi.com, um, I will make sure to add you to a list of, I, I'll send you that stuff when I find it out. Okay, dlover at arrowsi.com. Uh, great info, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, when will AADS be supported in vSphere 6.5? That's a great question. I don't know the exact versions of when, I know a bunch of stuff just got uh, supported with 6.5 very recently, and I don't know if AADS is on that list. So I don't know if that. Um, and I got another comment from our very own SBC uh, implementer extraordinaire, Mr. Mike Clothier, that says URI groups will allow blocking or allowing of users. So great, thank you, Mike, I appreciate that, sir. Um, and I think that's all the questions that we have. So we've got a lot of people that hung around to the end. Really appreciate it. I'll hope, hopefully I'll get this posted um, out to out, you know, the YouTube channel on our website today. Um, Sarah usually sends me uh, uh, the file pretty quick and I can get it posted up. So for all of you that joined today, appreciate it in a big way. Thanks. Um, and hopefully this was helpful and interesting and, and um, maybe even got you a little excited about the coolness of Equinox. Uh, and it's, it's actually pretty easy to deploy. Um, little gotchas here and there, not even gotchas, but little th things to think about. And again, number one, make it easy for your end users. Apple proved to us that if you make it easy, you will get mass adoption and that's what you're driving. You want everyone to have this stuff. Um, it's, it makes it so much easier for people to use when they know that there's somebody at the other end who actually has the same client. Um, make it easy, and uh, that'll drive adoption like crazy, so do it. Uh, if you have any questions, again, dlover, Uh Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. See ya. Bye.